This is Up Close. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. We all believe that we can find a cultural tradition and that we can find texts and other items to explore within it. But what are the ways that holes can get poked in that tradition? And how can a tradition be recovered or reclaimed? In the Jewish tradition, key texts have been changed with items removed, added, or altered. And in the cases we know about, it's largely the ultra-Orthodox determining what stays and what goes. University of Scranton professor Mark Shapiro reveals it all in Changing the Immutable, How Orthodox Judaism Rewrites Its History. And if there's any narrative most obviously missing from traditional Jewish texts, it's the stories of women's lives. Using short stories to fill in some gaps is American Jewish University professor Michal Lemberger in After Abel and Other Stories. But first, here's my interview with Mark Shapiro. So you've, uh, you've kind of made a career of exploring what does it really mean to be Orthodox, or what has it meant to be Orthodox? And, and finding that a lot of Orthodoxy today is built on a, very much a myth of the past. Societies generally create myths. I mean, American society has myths, Israeli society has myths, and Orthodox society, of course, has myths. And uh, what's very interesting about Orthodox society is that uh, the myths often change because uh, what, is, what I tried to show in this book is what is, was acceptable, in quotes, uh, maybe uh, 200 years ago is today no longer acceptable. And since we're dealing with a tradition that b basic to being a traditional Jew is, like the word tradition, you follow tradition, that creates problems when the way you're living is not in line with the way people lived hundreds of years ago because the ultimate validation of a traditional society is that you're following the tradition. And therefore, uh, the approach adopted by many, as I described, is uh, we're talking about the elites, because they're the ones who control the outlay of information, is to recreate the tradition, to recreate a mythical past to serve the needs of the present. What you've done is you've gone through, to a degree, going back to at least medieval times, perhaps some semi-ancient stuff, uh, where you found examples of not only of censorship but of justification for censorship and then seen that layer upon itself and layer upon itself through the modern era. Is there one discovery here that you were just very surprised by recently? I can't believe someone actually tried to pull this off or did pull it off. There is uh, a medieval authority who explains that um, Leia Describing why well, the she matriarchs. Was hated. Yeah, the matriarch, uh, you know, there was uh, Leia and there was Rachel, and uh, Leia was not beloved as much as Rachel. That he states that um, Jacob, the patriarch, used to beat Leia. And that's why she was so upset. Now, uh, this was so shocking that even a 19th century publisher recognized the problem and uh, refused to insert it, uh, refused to include it there, deleted it. And it was only about 15 years ago when it was published for manuscript that we actually see what uh, was written. And uh, I then uh, explored the matter of, uh, I mean, that's the idea again today, the idea that you could beat, you know, beat your wife. I mean, uh, everyone would assume, of course, Judaism thinks that that's uh, forbidden, it's crazy, it's evil, all these things. And yet, if you look at the sources, you see not, that's not the case, that there were great rabbis who thought otherwise. Part of what you're revealing here is not just that texts were changed, but how they were changed and how we can recover some of their original uh, statements. I have asked, I work at a Catholic university and I have scholars there, there are scholars there of Catholicism, I, I know scholars in Islam, I have asked my colleagues, now I, it could be they don't know but everything about this matter, but I've asked my colleagues, are there in the major, you know, asked trends of Christianity and Islam, do you have the phenomenon that I document in this book? That is of a rewriting of texts, of trying to cover up the history of the past. They, there's no question that both Islam and Christianity did that in pre-modern times, but none of them have been able to point me to examples where today you find that going on. And, um, you find it all the time in orthodoxy, in certain segments of orthodoxy. So that itself um, is, is significant. There are elites who have the information, and they determine what information should be filtered to the masses. And uh, sometimes it's in official fashion, like a newspaper, which uh, we mentioned yet, Tate Namman or others. Other times it's uh, in an unofficial fashion, uh, an individual publisher who makes this decision on his own. We have other examples. but. Uh, there's no question that you have this paradigm of the elites who have access to the information 
making decisions, paternalistic decisions, on behalf of the masses, what they should and shouldn't know. And now, giving names and stories to women of the Bible, Michal Lemberger. There's a long tradition of Midrash, of taking the stories of the Bible, which are occasionally brief, occasionally uh, surprisingly lacking in detail, um, occasionally confusing, and then expanding on those stories. And that seems unquestionably what you've done here. I have an academic background, and my academic background is in what in the English world, the, li the literature world, we call biblical literature and American literature. And, and I wrote a dissertation and I pulled those two together. So I'd been thinking about the confluence for a long time. And then I taught. Bible as literature at UCLA um, and then at American Jewish University and each time I could go a little bit deeper into the scholarship, into the text, so it, had, it just percolated for a really long time. You've got stories, so like Lot's wife, for example, yeah. who doesn't have a name in the Bible, you've given her the name. Pua. But So how do you reimagine that story? Uh, well, it is kind of a spoiler to say that, here it is, she is the one who rains down the fire and brimstone, but I think I know for a fact that what drew me is the detail that gets ignored everywhere else, which is that in negotiating for his guest's safety, Lot offers his daughters to be gang raped. And that is shocking to a modern sensibility and unjust, and no one seems to care about that. You know, Christian commentary, we all know what, you know, sodomy comes from there, although it doesn't happen in the story at all. And Jewish commentators talk about selfishness, right? that they weren't, they weren't, they didn't open their homes, they weren't gracious. But nothing about this offer. And so f for me, who has two daughters, uh, what mother would let that happen? Now, of course, there are mothers who would let that happen. That's another story altogether. But from my perspective, what mother would let that happen? And so she doesn't let it happen. In general, with your stories, one of the things you say in your your uh, your end note uh, mm -hmm. on the uh, on on all of these is that you've not tried to somehow impose modern values or right. to try to to try to bring those or update the stories or bring them into the present. You've tried as much as possible. Like if they were struggling because of the circumstance of being a woman or being poor mm -hmm. or of being in the middle of a desert, you made that, you wanted that struggle to remain a real part of the character. Yeah, it, setting is important. A lot of people have updated these stories very successfully, you know, taken the idea of Job and put a Job-like character into 21st century New York, for example. That's not a specific story that I'm referring to. But my expertise is not in that. What I have done is really immersed myself in the ancient world for 20 years, and so I feel like I know it in some ways. I know it imperfectly, I can't actually go back, but I can imagine it. I can imagine it as real. And it's a complicated world. We tend to think of biblical world as simple because we get a simple story, but it's just as complicated as our own world, and we may have to work a little harder to see that complication. That's all for this week's abbreviated web episode of Up Close. A reminder, you can see the full episode of Up Close on the Jewish channel on cable, or listen to the full audio of the show as a podcast, available on iTunes and your favorite podcast player. The Jewish channel is available on cable, Time Warner Cable Channel 1640, Ioplum Channel 505, RCN Channel 268, Cox Cable Channel 1, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, and on Comcast on the on-demand menu on the Jewish channels. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.